Um, thank you for coming. Um, my name is Ken McGrage. Um, I have a slide for this in a second. I'll skip it. Um, I Well, what the heck, I'll do it. Uh, I'm a technology evangelist um, for ThoughtWorks. I've been with ThoughtWorks for about nine years. And um, most of my job has been talking to people about continuous delivery. Um, I'm very lucky, blessed, whatever word you want to use, and then I started at ThoughtWorks exactly when we were starting a bunch of the work on continuous delivery. And I actually worked for the product side of the company. Don't worry, no product pitches, I promise. Um, I worked for the product side of the company, which has allowed me to see hundreds and hundreds of implementations and work with lots of different companies on creating continuous delivery pipeline. Um, it allowed me to, to get a lot of that kind of experience that, that I'd like to share with you here today. Um, I'm going to start actually with some definitions. And it's interesting because uh, for, for everybody that was in the keynote this morning, I would say basically everything Gregor said was right. And you could probably just take that for the day. Uh, he did use a definition of DevOps. And I actually have my own too. So what I'd like to start with, when I, when I start a talk with definitions, excuse me, the purpose here is to let you know what I mean when I use a word or a phrase. Uh, it's not to try to get you to adopt it. It's not to try to say yours is wrong or theirs is wrong and mine is right. It's so that while I'm here on stage, or if you're coming to the workshop this weekend, that when I say a word, you know what I mean. So for DevOps, this is my definition of DevOps. The key phrase there is, I think that DevOps is a culture. I don't think you can do DevOps. You certainly can't buy DevOps. As I mentioned, I work for the tool vendor side of our company. Buying GoCD will not give you the DevOps. Okay? It is a culture. Uh, and it's about working together and everything, and I, that's why I love Gregor's talk so much. It's about a team that's working together to own the thing, to operate the system, etc. cetera. Uh, if you're so inclined, there's a blog there that actually breaks down each phrase and what I mean by that. Um, but when I say DevOps, this is what I mean. A little test that I often will do, um, in fact, I find myself doing this subconsciously, is I do a word substitution. So when someone says DevOps, I substitute culture in my head, even if I don't mean to. So that's why when you, you see, a lot of people will say, look, I don't think that DevOps engineer is a thing, or Gregor mentioned DevOps practice leads, or you know, et cetera, because culture engineer is not a thing. A DevOps coach, awesome, you know, et cetera, but DevOps itself is the culture. Continuous delivery, on the other hand, is what a lot of people think of when they say, I'm going to do DevOps. Continuous delivery is the technical practices that move software from your inventory, your source code management system, through a pipeline um, into production. And as Gregor said, that's where the work really starts. That's where now I get to measure things, et cetera. Um, continuous delivery does a lot of things for you. A DevOps culture does a lot of things for you. Uh, I'll go into some of those in this talk, but primarily it's that thing that you can get it to people faster and so that you can measure its effectiveness. So, you know, tests like I'm selling hotels. Do I sell more hotel rooms with this change or less, et cetera? That's why we do these things. Okay, so now why this talk specifically? As I mentioned, I've had the privilege of working with lots and lots of customers and hands on. I was a director of engineering myself for many, many years. Um, and people would say, yeah, I'm doing this thing, I'm, I'm practicing continuous delivery. And I'd say, okay, that's, that's awesome. Can I, can I see your pipeline? Can I hear about what you're doing? And you know, what have you. And what they would say is, yeah, I got continuous delivery, and here's my pipeline. And when it's done, then I give my installer to the security team, or the compliance team, or the what have you. And so in fact, it wasn't continuous delivery at all. Because I say that continuous delivery means that you can click a button literally right now. So you get a call, there's an emergency, whatever. Oh, deploy latest, click. If you don't feel safe doing that, then it's not quite, you don't have continuous delivery yet. You might have really good automated building tests. I certainly don't mean to insult anyone's processes. But it's not continuous delivery if you can't deploy to production right now. And so this talk is going to be high level in that it's going to cover a lot of topics. My goal of this talk is to show you Here's a bunch of things that you might not be thinking of in a continuous delivery mindset. Types of testing, types of managing code, types of deployments, et cetera. Uh, again, it's very high level and there's going to be a, cover a lot. And so, as Naresh said, if you're looking for more you know, hands-on practical and law of two feet, I will not be insulted if it's, hey, I, I need to know which security tests to run. Because I'm not going to cover that. I'm going to try to get you to do security tests. 
So why continuous delivery at all? It's interesting, um, coming especially to an Agile conference, is everyone's familiar with the Agile Manifesto, but not a lot of people have looked at page two, the principles behind the Agile Manifesto. Uh, and in fact, when uh, Jess Humble and Dave Farley were trying to name the book that they, that they wrote eight years ago, and they named it Continuous Delivery, this is where the name came from. Is the first principle behind the Agile Manifesto is that the highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of software. So it's interesting, I kind of see DevOps and continuous delivery as the, the fulfilling the promise of Agile from many, many, many years ago. And so I love that we're seeing DevOps and CD tracks in Agile conferences now. Because this is really where it came from. Um, and to that end, this might be very much review for a lot of people, but I want to go over something that anyone that's ever taken a the Scrum Master course, really any Agile 101 course, has probably seen this series of graphics. And Gregor kind of hinted to it too. When we do incremental work, we don't, you know, you don't do a painting like this. You don't complete the head and then add the shoulder and then add the other shoulder because there's not value to it, right? So partially done is not useful. I love Gregor's analogy of um, inventory and I'm going to steal it from here on if you're here, Gregor. Um, because it's not usable until it's done when you do it this way. And so is it incremental? Yes, but it's not deliverable. It's not a minimum viable product, et cetera. So what we really want to do is this. And I, I did. I went back into our, our training materials and grabbed this slide from a 15-year-old Agile deck on why we do iterative development. So what this is allowing you to do is to do the iterative development that you've come to love and, and should, but then also be able to deliver at any time and get at least some value find out do people like it, et cetera. That's one reason that, that we think continuous delivery is important. The other one is the ability, another one, there's many, is the ability to re respond to security issues. These days it's not if you're going to get hacked or if a library you use is going to get compromised or what have you, it's when, for sure. And what you want to be able to do is react quickly though. So this one's a little bit old now, um, it was Heartbleed, it was a, a vulnerability in open SSL library. And it affected a massive amount of, especially web software. Lots and lots of people were affected, and it took people, in many cases, weeks to get fixes up there. So they were vulnerable for that time. Um, and frankly, it wasn't very hard to exploit. People that had mature continuous delivery pipelines were able to update their infrastructure, because that's also part of the pipeline. That's code, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, say, oops, I need the new OpenSSL library. Runs all their tests, because every pipeline runs all the tests all the time and get it to production very, very quickly. So and we had projects that we got the, the CVE, the, the uh, announcement about Heartbleed, and new, new stuff went in production within an hour or so. Um, and you can do that if you have something that's deployable all the time. Anybody know the story of Knight Capital? I'd love to be the first one to let tell people know that. You can't, no spoilers. <laughs> the other one I'm going to get to at the end. I'll give you a hint, it has to do with risk management. I want to talk a little bit about continuous integration. And as, as you probably got, because I did a definitions thing, I think words are important. I think when, when I say to a coworker that we're doing CI or continuous integration, there needs to be a meeting of the minds of what that means. There's a lot of people that say, hey, we're doing continuous integration, that by the definition really are not. Um, and again, might be OK. Um, ThoughtWorks has a thing that we call the tech radar. And in it, we put um, practices and like a bunch of different stuff. And we have a category where we say, on hold, don't do this anymore, et cetera. We recently had to add a section called CI theater. It was the illusion of doing continuous integration when you're not actually doing it. So you know, I downloaded Go, or I downloaded Jenkins, or I downloaded Bamboo, and I set up a pipeline. And it's always green, because I'm running four tests. Um, so I'm doing CI. It's like, yeah, not really. <laughs> um, there's a lot more in the tech radar, but we really want to avoid this. The one that scared me the most is um, my division actually did a follow-on study. We did a study, and I'm not going to say it was purely scientific, because like our Twitter audience and our followers, and so a bit of a bubble, if you will. In our study, only 10% of the, the, the participants acknowledged that having a CI server was different than practicing CI. It's like, yeah, we do CI, we have, we have Go, we have Jenkins, we have Bamboo, we do CI. It's like, no, no, products don't actually solve problems. You know, the tools are important, but they're not the solution. And so it's important. So I'm going to go through a few things that we think are, I think, are core to doing continuous integration. 
Um, the first category is code management. I'm going to go through this one at a high level, but there's actually a talk this afternoon about this particular pattern. Um, I haven't seen the talk, I'm, but it's an important talk. Feature branching. Um, I hate it with passion. <laughs> okay, so here's the issue with feature branching, because I understand why people do it. I honestly do. I'm working on a new feature. I don't know if it's going to even go this way. I don't really know what it's going to look like. We're still kind of figuring it out. Um, the developers are the architects, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to be safe. And we want to make sure that if we take tr trunk or mainline right there in the middle, that I can still deploy that if I had to. So what happens here is you have Professor Plum and Reverend Green. And these are literally stolen off Martin Fowler's Blicky. Um, when you're Martin Fowler, you get to make up words. It's not a blog or a wiki. It's a Blicky. Um, and I want to say it's not, this slide's nine years old. But at any rate, this is a common pattern for feature branching. So you have Professor Plum and you have Reverend Green. And Professor Plum's working on her branch, and she's doing you know, commits to her branch and everything else and doing, doing great work. And there's a bug fix made on mainline, so that gets pulled in. And meanwhile, Reverend Green's working on his branch, and that's working on. And a, it pulls in that same bug fix, and everyone's working, and everyone's fine. What we have here is a literal grace condition. They both want to be first to get back, OK? Because what happens is when Professor Plum finishes her feature, and she now merges it back into mainline, her merge is fine, because she was pulling the bug fixes the whole time, right? Reverend Green does his next pull, and I think the technical term for this is big ball of mud. There's all these merge conflicts that now have to be fixed. Well, hey, wait a minute, Ken. There's lots of merge conflict tools out there. These are really easy to fix these days. Um, it's easy to fix the text differences. It's not easy to fix the intent. It's not easy to know why did they change this thing that's now conflicting with the thing that I worked on, you know, et cetera. And so it just, it's really <laughs> not friendly. So what we would rather see you doing when you practice continuous integration is pushing your code to trunk or master every single day. I would say if you're not doing this, you're not doing CI, full stop. Okay, you might be doing really good automated build and test. You might have you know, great scripts, et cetera. But it's not continuous integration, because though that word means something. Now, in this world of distributed version control systems, I'm not saying you never make a branch. If I'm going to work on something, the first thing I do is get checkout dash B branch name, right? But we're still pushing back to master or trunk every single day. And our continuous integration server is watching that. Um, you know, sometimes it might watch a branch for another reason or what have you. But we're practicing what we preach here and going into, into trunk every single day. When that happens, your continuous integration server is running all the tests all the time, every single time. OK, the purpose of a continuous delivery pipeline, I didn't make a slide for this, but the purpose of a continuous delivery pipeline is to kill a release candidate. OK, it's to prove that the commit you made is not good enough to give to your customers. You can't prove something's good. OK, a green build doesn't mean it's good. It means that all your tests pass. If you, just, you can do that just by not having any tests, or not having very good tests. So what we want to do is we want to run all the tests all the time, and I'll get more into how to do that. But what we want to do is we want to prove, oh, nope, that didn't pass our whatever test, and so it can't go any further. That's what the CD pipeline's for. Now, in order to be effective with that, when the build is broken, it has to be fixed immediately. So if you have a stage in your build that's, yeah, it's always red, don't worry about it. Um, we're using an API to this third-party vendor, and it's a little bit flaky, and the network goes up and down. And so you know, we, we kind of expect that stage to be red. You know, let's, let's not worry about that too much. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> because there might be other things happening there, right? And so you, 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 you're doing the thing, and you think it's fine, and my, you commit my code, and I you commit my code, excuse me, and that one turns red, but I'm just going to force it to keep going because I know that one's red. And meanwhile, a week later, you find out, ooh, I actually did break it. Now you have a week's things to go through, et cetera. I would much rather you remove a flaky test. To me, a test that's, that's flaky is worse than no test. OK, so pipeline is a little bit of an overloaded term. Um, think of a pipeline as just uh, the way, because again, I like to define the way I mean something, is it's the workflow or the, the value stream, however you want to look at it, of how code goes from source code management to you know, production and beyond, maintenance, et cetera. Um, and it's very common for people to create pipelines that are very linear. So I do the thing, I run a unit test, I run a functional test, I put it on staging, and then it goes to security or compliance or production or you know what have you. 
and now we have to do a change management board, you know, etc. I would like to convince you, if I can, that there are pipelines, there's types of automated testing that you can and should be doing um, as part of your normal pipeline, as part of your development team. Um, I was having a conversation at dinner the other night uh, talking about you know the word DevOps and it leaves out security and leaves out QA and what have you. Um, you know, I think when I think of developing the application, I think that's all of the developing the application. That's coming up with the idea and writing the story and writing the code and writing the test. And that's de developing this. And that needs to include all of the tests. So, security is one that um, is very uncommon to see as actually part of the pipeline. Often this is because of you know, external security teams, lack of expertise on the team. There's, there's valid reasons for it. I'm going to show you some ways to, to try to overcome that. Um, but I want to encourage you to include some of these things in your, in your pipeline. First off, there are tests you can do before you even commit. So there's, there's tools out there, and I don't want to uh, advocate any specific tools, but you know, Q&A afterwards, if people want to come up, they can ask for them, whatever you. Uh, we don't make any of these. But there's tools out there that'll do pattern matching on your commit and say, ooh, that looks like an AWS key. Nope. Not even going to allow it to hit GitHub, because if it hits GitHub, you're dead. I mean, if, once it's up there, you have to kill it. Um, so there's things you can do on your local stuff in some of your unit tests, et cetera, before you even commit. Obvious stuff, you know, static application security testing, uh, actually run the thing, run penetration tools, et cetera. Now, I want to be clear here. I'm not in the camp that says you can automate all the things. I think you can automate most of the things, but security especially is an area where there are people who specialize in this that I have a good friend of mine, Jason, who he sits in a dark room and goes after your application and he's gonna get in. Okay, and I can't ever write a test to be Jason. Okay, so I'm not saying that these people don't exist, but if we have good automated testing, we can take that out of band. We have that not being a blocker. They can be working full time, doing penetration, doing the thing, and when they find something, now that becomes you know the next high priority story or whatever. But there's lots of things you can do automated. Uh, if you look up um, OWASP, there's lists of tools there uh, that you can use. There's lots of open source stuff. There's commercial tools. There's um, lots of things you can do here, and you really need to be. One of the most basic ones that I almost never see, and Sonotype actually did a study. Um, they call it the value stream. So Sonotype is a company that runs um, Maven, Nexus. And so they see all the Java open source stuff. And they did a study, and I'm going to be probably off a little bit on the numbers here because I, I'm weird about not putting notes on here because then I get fixated on the notes. Um, I want to say they said the average open source Java project was something like 120 libraries. And 21% of them had known vulnerabilities for which fixes had been released. But the Maven Palm file specified a version that was vulnerable, and they, nobody knew it. There are tools that will scan that, you know, uh, that they're, that'll just say, nope, you're using an old gem, uh, or using an old palm, or what have you. So um, in research, I encourage you, again, we can talk after and get more. Um, don't have time to go through all of them. This one I almost never see in a pipeline, um, is actual performance testing. Uh, who here has never, <laughs> I'm gonna do this because I know nobody has to raise their hand, who here has never gone on their computer, gone on their browser, gone to a site, and sit there and waited for it to load and say, this one's too slow, going to a competitor? Okay, don't even bother raising your hand, because we've all done it. Okay, performance testing will lose you business. Um, Amazon and others have done studies about this. It's, it's amazing how fast, it's measured in seconds, that people are like, boop, see ya. So, you know, do load testing. What can I actually do? What, what, what can I, what can I, my thing take? Stress testing. So throw you know, a higher load at it and see where it crashes. And you measure your risk. It's like, oh, well, OK, if we get famous, then that's going to be a problem. But, but that's, a, that's OK. I'm not worried about that. Um, now, these are the ones that I, all, again, almost never see. So a soak test is something that will run the application for an extended period of time and say, hey, over time, performance is degrading for this reason or that reason or the other reason. Um, but nobody wants to put these in their pipelines because they slow the pipeline down. Everyone says, well, no, then it takes me three days to get to production because I have a soak test that runs for two days, um, not to mention they're expensive and so forth. And so you know, I'm not going to do that every time. We'll just do that when we can. There's ways around that. Um, and then the other one, I wish Naresh was here. I was going to tease him because the confident insight went down yesterday. <laughs> um, 
is you know spike testing. You know, if you're in an industry, you're, you're going to get depressed, what have you, throw tons of stuff at it, just all of a sudden see what happens. These can all be automated. Now, I'm not a believer that deploys per day and how fast I can get to production and those kinds of things should be a metric that drives behaviors, um, unless that's important to your business. Okay? Um, uh, there's a slide that, that a well-known speaker does that says something like, you know, hey, we did 22 deploys per day. Congratulations. Said no CEO ever. You know, they just don't care. If that is a thing for yours, then that's great. But that said, there are ways you can do, you can run these pipelines that you can still get very fast response. Okay, so any modern continuous delivery server can do parallel processing. And by parallel stuff here, I don't mean, you know, two tasks in a Jenkins job that when, the, when they all finish, the job's done. I mean completely separate pipelines on completely separate environments, potentially with completely separate permissions. And I can run a lot of these things in parallel. And you can decide where you want the cutoffs to be. You can decide which of these might require a manual approval for reasons, which of these you want to be fully automated and so forth. So this is just one very, very fictional chart. But the idea here is we have some unit tests here. I love it, the unit tests are for confidence. That's all they're for. You have your unit tests and those pass. So now I'm going to take that thing that I just built. Okay, I'm going to pick on Java because Java. Um, so I pick a jar. And my unit tests have passed, so I have the jar. I store that jar in a, in a repository. I'm not going to rebuild it ever again. I'm going to take that jar then, and I'm going to put it on an environment that starts my functional tests. This is very normal. Lots of people do that. But what they then do is they take this chart, and I should have done one, and they do it very linear. That when the functional tests are done, then it'll run the load test. When the load tests are done, then they'll run the spike test, etc. I don't want to do that. I want to put it on three environments simultaneously. Um, in this lovely world of public cloud, this is actually pretty inexpensive. It's not free, but it's inexpensive. I can run things on multiple environments simultaneously. Um, you can do things in dependency management. This is commonly conferred, uh, referred to, excuse me, in continuous delivery as fan out, fan in. So notice the top, the three there in the second column. So I do a unit test that fans out to three different pipelines. I need to have logic in my system that says if and only if all three of these pass, then we're going to run staging. If any one of them fail, and again, these are not just tasks in one job, so we actually have to check for this. Um, if any one fail, then I'm not going to go to staging. Now, staging in this diagram, the purpose is to test a production-like deployment. Okay, so my staging system looks as much like my production system as possible. You know, if production is a cluster, then staging is a cluster. It might be a different size, it might not be, etc. But it looks as much like it as possible. And so it's going to run the installation of the application or the deployment of the application in exactly the same way that production is going to do it. So again, its purpose is to test the deployment. That being the case, I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to allow that to happen, even if those longer running tests, like the stress tests and soak tests, are not done. Because again, I want to, I want to test that as often as possible so that when I do go to production, then we know we're good. Okay. Um, short little story. It's going on 11, 12 years ago. Um, uh, our company, ThoughtWorks, was on a project in England. And they were working on a project. And again, I'm picking on Java. And, but the project was the developer machines were Windows machines. And they were building a Java application. And the deployment target was Solaris. And you know, Java runs the same everywhere, right? <laughs> um, in the project plan, in the Gantt chart, they didn't have Solaris hardware until several months into the project. So they're writing code, and they're you know, doing the things, and so forth. Um, they finally got Solaris hardware, no problem, ran the deployment, put it on Solaris, it didn't work. And I don't mean there were bugs or whatever, it would not start. There was things they were doing in the way that it accesses the file system that simply did not work on NFS, on Solaris. And so they had to scramble. They wrote a tool um, called Conan the Deployer. Um, and went and literally stole a Solaris box from some other office and then told them, hey, we stole your E450, um, and put up a staging server. The purpose of it was to test the deployment. They were going to, every time they had a good build, they were going to test it on Solaris to make sure that it deployed. Um, two of those people, Jez Humble and Dave Farley, went on to write a book called Continuous Delivery because they were really not happy with what happened. Um, that book would not exist if they had a staging server. Kind of weird twist of fate. Um, and I do want to make the case that this is not fictional. 
Okay, this is a real pipeline from a real project that's in our office here in Coromandela. And what we see here is multiple pipelines running in parallel. And notice there's also even lots and lots of different Git repos. So this particular one is an open source project. And you know when a person does a pull request to GitHub, that kicks off the pipeline. But there are also security scans and tests and those kinds of things that are not part of that developer team. Question in the back? Pardon me? I can't hear you. What's not visible? Oh, the text. It, that, it's not, I'm sorry. Yeah, I know it's an eye chart. You can't read it. Um, it's, it's a little bit on purpose because I don't want you to be say these are the pipelines that should be there. It's to show you that it's complex. Yeah. I have a weird thing. If you come to my workshop on Sunday, we're doing a Hello World application. People are like, hey, why are we deploying a real app? Because it's not about the app. It's about the pipeline. Uh, the point here really is to see the boxes. So in this case, the squares are pipelines and the circles are Git repos. So, but thank you for that feedback anyway. Uh, maybe I'll, well, actually, wait a minute. That one more readable? <laughs> it's a zoom in on the side. Um, but the point is here that we're doing different things in a different order, which is determined by the team that's doing this particular application. And some of the things are out of band. So like, if I wasn't logged into this system as an admin when I did the screenshot, some of those pipelines would not be visible to you. So the reality is that we would love it, we being you know, the DevOps people, <laughs> whoever that is, um, would love it if we were all really self-organized teams and we all fed ourselves with two pizzas a la Amazon and we really did control everything. But the truth is we have compliance departments and we have security departments and we have those kinds of things. And so they can put their pipeline in parallel with yours. Your jar passes, it comes out, runs their test, I almost said a product name, um, runs their things, make sure the compliance is good and everything else, and the triggers there say that they can't go any further if either one of them fail. And so it's completely possible, and frankly mainstream, that you can do these things and you can include those departments sooner in your development life cycle. I would love it if they were sitting on your team. You know, if there had been a Solaris admin sitting on that team in London saying, Who you do that, man, ain't going to work, um, then it would have solved the problem, right? But that's not always reality. I would love if they're on our team. But if they're not, still, encourage them to say, that's great, but let's automate as much of your tests as we can and bring it forth in the cycle. Uh, our, our head of infosecurity, a, a woman by the name of Joanne Molesky, co-wrote a book called Lean Enterprise. Um, she's an auditor by trade. And she's like, her favorite thing as an auditor is to go sit with the dev team for a few weeks to understand the risks and everything. She's like, here's all the things I have to test if I don't know what you're building. If I go sit with you for a few weeks and I learn more about what you're doing, then I know what I have to test and we all get along better. My life's easier, there's less things, etc. If I don't know what you're doing, I gotta test all the things. But if I know what you're doing and I know why you're doing it and I know what the risk profile is and I know which system's hitting, etc., and that's not a that's not a three hour status meeting. That's embedding with the team for a few weeks. And I kind of get already the spoiler here, but you decide the order. I'm showing you charts, and this is one of the reasons why it's not readable. Is I don't want you to, to get fixated and say, okay, that's the order Ken said he should do it. He's been doing continuous delivery for 400 years, so it, no. You decide the order based on your risk profile and when you need feedback, because you want the fastest possible feedback. Uh, but again, any modern tool can do this. Okay, so I've been ranting about um, always being able to deploy, right? Deploy right now. But user stories don't usually take six minutes to complete. So the truth is, there's a lot of times when work is in progress. I'm, I'm not done with that story. If I hit deploy, the, 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 the thing's going to come out and it's going to present a user experience where they're going to click a button and nothing's going to happen. And that's bad. Okay. There's lots and lots and lots of ways of deploying incomplete work. I'm going to go through just a few of them. One of my favorites is a concept called feature toggles. And again, this is not a new concept. <coughs> this particular screenshot, again, stolen from Martin Fowler, um, is several years old. And basically what it's saying is, I'm going to create a new feature that has an impact to the user experience, changing the UI. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is write some kind of definition that turns that feature off. Now that could be a simple text file. People do these in databases. Um, there's SaaS products that do this, et cetera. But it's just a little thing that says, if we're in, if we're in development, it's off, or it's on. If we're in whatever, then it's on. Then it's on. And, it, and then you do your UI. And so what happens is, when you run that program, you load that web page, whatever, on anything other than your development environment, it looks like the old one, because it's turned off. 
And what you can do then is you can turn it on when you want to test it or when it's done. Fast forward to about a year and a half ago, um, another colleague uh, updated the article and goes into a lot more detail. Um, and I've, I've, I've tried to include references here, and I know they're going to distribute slides later because I know this is pretty high level. I highly recommend this article talking about these feature toggles because feature toggles are a great way to deploy and complete work, as I talked about, but they also have a lot of other uses. And this article goes into quite a bit of depth about different ways to use them and toggle routers and that kind of thing. And I can test markets. I can feature a toggle uh, programmatically and say, OK, I want to see if I turn this on for 10% of the audience in Bangalore, um, do my hotel reservations go up or down? And oh, they went down, turn it off. Oh, they went on, turn it up. OK, so there are a lot of ways to do things. Now, feature toggles are tech debt. So you're adding code that once you're done, it needs to be cleaned up, okay? So be aware of that. I love where, where we're saying, you know, people don't want to do DevOps because it's faster. It's not faster. It's better, you'll get faster feedback, you know, those kinds of things. But completing that user story is not faster, it's slower. Because you're going to do more automation, you're going to do things like toggles, you're going to be cleaning up tech debt, you know, et cetera. It's better overall for the business. That's why um, a lot of people like things like lean value stream mapping and so forth. I want to look at the entirety of the process, not one task. But these become into a lot of value. There's lots of different kinds of toggles. And so from this same blog, you see here that we have a release toggle. So um, I want to differentiate deploy from release. OK, deploy, especially in the, the world of web software and what have you, is taking the software and installing it on the machines and making sure it's running, et cetera. Release is making it available to the customer. Okay, you can deploy software onto running machines, have routing rules or whatever, where they can't actually see it yet. Have feature toggles where it's turned off. So it's deployed. I can run a test, verify the deployment went OK, et cetera, and then flip the toggle, and now it's released. Um, you know, a lot of our products, the, I mean, well, everything is toggled in our project. We uh, Branches are strictly forbidden. and. If you, there's actually a lot of them that if you download, like if you download Go, there's a config file. You can go in there and start playing with toggles and you're going to break stuff, but they're there. There's also things like ops toggles, permissions, experiments, etc. cetera. So um, uh, a lot of the web scale companies, the Netflixes and the Facebooks and the what have you, they have toggles in there for things like performance degradation. So there's a denial of service attack, performance is really bad right now, etc. cetera. They'll go in there and turn off certain features that are less used or not important to their core business. Okay, my favorite is like is Netflix, the one where you go watch movies. They turn off their recommendation engine under periods of high load, so you can still see all the things. And you're, if you're watching the movie at home, it's not going to change. But if you go log out and you say recommendations, it's not going to give you any, or they won't be up, they won't be refreshed. And that's a toggle. They can go, oops, we're in trouble. Okay, but it's not visible to you. So that's for, for a one way. There's many others. This is one way for um, user-facing things. But what about back-end things? So um, a lot of times you have things that you need to upgrade. Uh, let's see what's a good example. Well, so we have a project that's Ruby on Rails, and it's 10 years old. So it was a 10-year-old version of Rails, and they wanted to upgrade Rails. Or you know, library X, pick your library. Uh, now, how do I do this if it's not on a branch? Because now I have all kinds of things. There's, this, there's this, this idea of branch by example, a branch by abstraction, and I think, yeah, that blog's from 2011, on continuousdelivery.com, which is Jez Humble's website. And basically, you have your consumers that are using this, this service, this library, whatever it is, a component, and they're pointing to the component. What you do is you stick an abstraction layer in there, and it's now talking to the component. And then you add the new component next to it, and you can go back forth and you can talk to them that way. And so what it allows you to do is incrementally move over to the new component, the new functionality, the new version of Rails, while not degrading anything else. And if I make UI changes, they're still everywhere, et cetera. It's a really good way to do this. This was important for one of our products because they were in the middle of that Rails upgrade when Heartbleed came out. Um, and yet they still could update OpenSSL, click the button, and deploy right now. Okay, Because it was safe. It wasn't like... If you downloaded it and you turned on Rails 4, which I think it was at the time, it would have broken horribly, uh, but it would have worked if you changed the defaults. This next part, I, I put in managing risk. It almost could have been in the part I just finished. Um, it's an example that's fairly new. And, and again, homework. I'm going to encourage you to read the associated blog. Um, GitHub Engineering had a problem. Um, the 
merge commit client, the merge commit library inside Git, the, the core thing of Git, was really not very performant. And you know, if we're practicing CI, right, we've got our own branch and we're merging it every day, all day, et cetera. We're pulling people, merging. I mean, merge happens lots and lots and lots. And yet, it was really just not very good. But it's also a feature that it's, their users are using all the time. So I can't break it. You know, I can't come on the new version and risk that something's going to go wrong. Merge has to work. So what they did is, they, they, in this case, they used a, a tool called Ruby Scientist. And if you were using GitHub during this period, and you did a merge, what it did is it called the old merge. And that's the one that actually merged your code and went into your repo and your other folks' poll. But at the same time, they called the new library. And they did a bunch of metrics and testing and you know, et cetera on that, and were able to do this thing. So they were testing in production at that scale, because it was a performance issue, right? You can't test it on a laptop, doesn't do any good. You have to test it at that scale. So what they ended up doing, what they ended up finding, um, and again, I don't expect you to be able to read these, but the blue line is the old client, and the green line is the new client. I don't know if I can zoom that in at all. That's OK. But what they noticed is that you know at first they were a little better, and then it got about equal, and then the green one got really bad in some edge cases that they figured out. Uh, if you care, <laughs> if you had merge conflicts that were a multiple of 256, so if you had 256, 512, 768 merge conflicts, um, the old library would not highlight that there were any conflicts. It would just merge it and tell you everything was okay. But you know, I mean, it's such an edge case they didn't find it, right? But they actually did find it here. Um, but if you could see this chart, what you see, and it's on, of course, on the blog there, is that at the end, it was orders of magnitude faster. And now they were able to go back into scientists and make it the default, and everybody was happy. And we didn't notice, but they got to save tons of money on hardware and processing power to not have to do all those merge conflicts with the, the, the library that just simply wasn't very good. I'm going to breeze through this part because uh, Gregor did it better justice than I'm going to. But for most of our projects, we really should be optimizing for MTTR, for mean time to recover. When something breaks, I stress the word when, <laughs> how long does it take me to recover? OK. Um, now, uh, I joke here and I say, hey, I, I'm on airplanes a lot. So if you're working for Airbus or Boeing or something, please do the latter, mean time between failure, or the former in this case. Because uh, there are things, there are systems that you do that we don't want to fail. Okay, but you probably want to optimize for MTTR. It's a really weird thing um, that if you optimize for MTTR, the MTBF actually gets better too. Lots of studies about that. Um, but you need to optimize there. Now, I want to be careful because anybody read the State of DevOps report? Comes out every year or two. It's good reading. Um, it's a, a, st a study they went out and interviewed thirty some thousand people over multiple years. And they said, okay, here, wh what are you doing, and what's your reaction time, and what's your MTTR, et cetera. And one of the metrics they used, um, which again, I'm not a crazy about, was they used deploys per day. And in 2016, it came out, and it was a certain baseline. We'll call that the baseline. Um, 2017, the study came out, and what they called the low performers, the people that were only deploying a couple times a year, were quite a bit better. They were now deploying weekly or monthly or what have you. Um, and so, yay, improvement, right? But their mean time to repair actually went up. Uh, metrics drive behaviors. They were now measuring on deploys per day, not actually the quality of the deployment. Okay, and so be careful that you don't go to the wrong metric. Okay, it, the, what a continuous delivery pipeline will help you do. One of the main things is recover quickly. Uh, it's not there to to, to say, "Ooh, look at me! I can check code and it's in production in three minutes." That's probably not a thing. So let's let's be careful there. From here on, some of this stuff is, especially if you're new to continuous delivery, if you're not doing this yet, if you're not actually deploying things automatically to production, et cetera, some of this might be aspirational, but I want to cover it because um, it's an important value that you'll get from having a solid continuous delivery pipeline. Just a couple patterns. Um, you might have heard these terms around uh, canary release is, and I kind of hinted at it earlier. This is where I do a, a release to a percentage of customers or percentage of end users, and I test it. And by test it, I don't mean does the login form show up? You know, is it expiring passwords? I mean, those are all important tests. But what I mean is you're testing the business amp impact. Did I sell more hotel rooms? Okay. And then you can make business decisions on that. It's a great way to do that. Um, all the web scale things do this, partially because they have to. But uh, it's a good way to go out and see is this working for its intended purpose? So, you know, acceptance criteria in a story, if you will. 
you know, if it's not making our work better, then let's take it out. Let's kill the epic. You know, whatever the, the, the analogy is that you want to do. This other one is really cool, and it's really um, it's only for certain cases. It's the idea of dark launching. So the most famous story, and again, there's a readme there, informant article. Um, Facebook Messenger. So Facebook Messenger is a real-time chat where you can chat to your friends you know, on Facebook. How do you test that at scale? I mean, Facebook has hundreds and millions of users. So they did this thing called dark launching. Basically, the feature is minimum viable product. It's ready. And you would log into your Facebook account, and some JavaScript in your browser sent a message to a certain percentage of your friends. You didn't send it. <laughs> the browser did. When they logged in, their browser got the message, and a certain percentage of them responded. And they had all this math where some of them were long conversations, some were short, and some never replied, and some were ignored, and some were sent to people that weren't your friends, and so they you know, needed to be not accepted, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But your browser was using Facebook Messenger for months before you were. And so when it came time to release it, again, not confusing deploy with release, what they did first is they flipped the release toggle for Facebook employees, which is a lot of people. And now they could, woo, woo, that's why I put the cap on every time. Um, then they would, they went to a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And eventually everybody had Messenger and there was some feedback and so forth, but there were no performance issues. I mean, that's a massive feature to deploy to that large of an audience and not have issues. And dark launching is how they did it. Now, one of the other things that your continuous delivery that will give you, and I've hinted at it quite a bit there, is feedback on what's going on. Part of that feedback, or all of that feedback, really, should be consumable. So when you're doing feedback loops, when you're giving feedback to the development teams, to the business analysts, to the people, OK, make it useful, please. Um, login failed is not useful. OK, it's, you know, couldn't connect to LDAP, blah, 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 is useful. OK, so for the developers in the room or, or people that are creating these logs, um, your ability to react, you know, I can have a continuous delivery pipeline that makes it so I can, can you know, deploy to release to right now. But if it's not, if you're not getting useful feedback, it doesn't do me a whole lot of good. So please do that. Same with alerts. So there's a thing that, you know, with DevOps or continuous delivery now, the developers carry pagers. It's not so much about the pager, but it is that people get alerted in certain situations. Please make sure that those situations merit an alert. Okay, if you have a cluster that has a thousand nodes and a physical piece of hardware goes down and 50 of those nodes go down at 3 a.m., that is not a critical error. Okay, it's just not. It's not going to affect your business at all. And so leave it. <laughs> Send an alert automatically at 8 a.m. Okay, there again, there's tools and software and stuff out there to do that. But if you know, people, when they, when they get that fatigue, and I, I do a talk a lot about burnout. Burnout is a huge medical problem in our industry. And a lot of it, people are afraid of you know, DevOps continuous delivery because they're afraid, well, now I'm going to get paged on the weekends and everything else. Um, make sure that they're useful. And I talked a little bit about running some of your tests in production. Now, there's a thing called the Gartner hype curve. This is my hand-drawn version of it. I want to be clear. Things are going to get worse before they get better. Okay, you're going to have to learn how to do feature toggles. You're going to have to learn how to measure your risk, you know, et cetera. Um, they, 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 the part when it goes up first, they call that the peak of expectations. Woo, I'm excited. But then there's the trough of disillusionment, and then it goes back up. So understand, this is like any other big change. This is like you know going to Azure for the first time, et cetera. Don't expect that it's a it's a miracle cure. It's not. You can't install a continuous delivery server and all of a sudden you can sit on the beach. Um, by the way, I need to go to Goa someday. But anyway. Um, so it is going to get a little bit worse before it gets better, but it is going to get better. It's going to get a lot better. I will finish with, I started the story about Knight Capital. Knight Capital is a trading firm. They did um, low volume, high value stock market trades. And they had a whole lot of tech debt. I won't go into the details, but you can Google it if you want. They had a whole lot of tech debt in there that hadn't been cleaned up. And in August 1st, 2012, an um, engineer went in and did what the engineers did. And they manually copied the new release to seven servers and started them up and made sure everything was good and then left. Well, the problem is that they had eight servers. And one of the toggles that they had, and it wasn't actually a toggle, one of the, I think it was a stored procedure. One of the names was reused. And that eighth server sent 
real orders and started buying stuff at ridiculous prices. And in almost exactly the time it took me to do this talk, they lost 440 million US dollars on a market cap of 400 million US dollars. They were gone in an hour. And it was because they didn't have automated processes that would have caught that. Okay, If that had been an automated deployment and the deployment to staging had used the same scripts that were going to go to fluid production, things might have happened. But there's lots of other causes here. I mean, so cause and effect is a really nasty thing. Um, but please don't do this. So summary. Um, again, it's using words. If you're in your organization and you're trying to get other people, I like, I like the missionary type big thing. If you're saying to the other team, hey, we're doing continuous delivery. Come take a look. This is what it means. If you're doing really automated good build and test, tell, then that's good too. They should come look at that. Uh, you don't have to use my definition. You don't have to use uh, 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 Gregor's definition. You do need to use your definition. If you say unit test to a coworker, they need to know what you mean. Okay. Good CI habits are the key. You cannot do a good continuous delivery pipeline if you're not doing solid CI. Feature toggles and with, oh, I'm over by six seconds. Thank you very much. I'll be around all day. I actually have a workshop on Sunday, too, where we're going to create one. I don't know, Lena, if there's, I went a little minute over. I don't know if there's time for questions or not. Sorry? Okay. I'll be around if you have any questions, but I went into your.